you ever had a moment where something just feels off? I've felt a little off in general lately, but there was one moment in particular several weeks ago. I was helping my parents move. We had been at their old house all day, loading up the moving truck, and we finally got to their new house around midnight. I had some rocking chairs in the back of my truck that needed to go on the front porch. So instead of trying to carry them all the way around the house, I was going to park on the sidewalk out in front of the house and carry them up the steps to the porch. Now, I had only been to their new house like once before, and their house is on the edge of downtown Grantville and sits right up on the street next to the sidewalk. So I drove past their house and circled back and parked right there in front. I quickly undid the tie-down straps and proceeded to carry the rocking chairs up the steps and onto the front porch. As I was about to get into my truck, I just had this unsettled feeling in my gut. Something just didn't feel right, and so I looked around and took stock of my situation. I looked at all the houses on the street, and finally it hit me. I had just put my parents' rocking chairs on their neighbor's front porch. So now, at midnight in Grantville, Georgia, I have to sneak back onto these people's porch, get the rocking chairs, put them back in my truck, and pray to God that nobody sees me and thinks that I'm stealing from my parents' neighbors. Thankfully, there aren't many people out at midnight in Grantville, and apparently my parents' neighbors are hard sleepers. Or maybe I'm just that sneaky. But the more that I've sat with today's text, I've had that same gut feeling. Something just feels off. Maybe it's just me, but you can decide for yourself as we turn to Mark chapter 11 and bear witness to the coming of our Savior. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it and will send it back immediately. So they went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the field. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the good news according to the gospel of Mark. The people of Jerusalem had expectations for Jesus. They had been living under the oppressive rule of Rome for generations. They must have been filled with anxiety and fear. They were holding on to hope that one day the Messiah would come and save them. The Messiah was supposed to defeat the Romans and recreate the kingdom of Israel. Well then, Jesus comes to town riding on a donkey as it was promised by the prophet Zechariah. This is the moment they've been waiting for. As Jesus is riding into town, people recognize who he is and what is about to happen. They're shouting, Hosanna, which means save us. Save us, Lord, Hosanna. They're stripping away their cloaks as, and offering them as an offering and celebration that Jesus has come to take away their pain, to fix the insecurity that they feel. Jesus is about to take down Rome. Now, I have to imagine there were some people who were preparing for battle waiting for Jesus to say the word, and they were ready to go and take up arms. But Jesus rides this donkey through the crowd. He goes into town, goes to the temple. He looks around, and then he goes home because it's late. Something feels off. He doesn't give a stirring speech and call people to arms or even call out the people in power. He doesn't take any of the steps needed to start a revolution. He looks around in the temple, and he goes home because it's late. Now each year during Lent, many of us choose to give something up or take something on. 
But one year when I was in high school, it became very trendy to add something new to your life instead of giving up chocolates or Cokes or sweets. And there's nothing wrong with adding something. In fact, we add things to our lives all the time. We buy new things, we join new clubs, we take on new roles at work or at church. Our kids age into new activities and before you know it, your schedule is completely booked every week with no room to, I don't know, just breathe. Lydie Klotz is an author and professor of engineering at the University of Virginia. He does fun studies with his college students where he shows them a kind of Lego bridge structure that is unstable and about to fall over. And because there's one block at the bottom that's out of place. Now the task for the group is to make the bridge more stable by either adding more blocks or taking them away. Now most of the time, the group sets out to build all kinds of elaborate structures to hold up this bridge. Even when the group is told that they have to pay 10 cents for each new block they add, it still doesn't occur to them to just take away the problem block. In another experiment, participants are given a 10 by 10 grid and within the grid there are green squares and white squares. Their task is to make the grid symmetrical from top to bottom and from left to right in as few clicks as possible. It takes less clicks when participants take away the green squares, but most people add squares to accomplish their task. And next, researchers add a second task. Participants also have to press the F key on their computer every time they see the number five scroll across the top of their screen. This only increased the percentage of people who chose to add blocks to make the grid symmetrical instead of taking things away. Researchers found that people had too much on their brains to be able to think through quicker and more efficient solutions. The quickest solution was always to take something away, but people's first instinct was often to add more. Now we don't know anything about having too much on our minds, do we? We're not stressed. We're not overwhelmed. It's not like we have full schedules or health issues to deal with or aging parents to care for or ever-changing children to raise and fitting in time to invest our relationships with our friends and our family and our faith community and all that time that we have for self-care. I mean, we have general conference this year and an election this year, but, you know, I'm feeling great and I'm sure that it's not going to be a big deal. I mean, what could happen? Everything's fine. It's fine. I don't know why my voice is so high. It's fine. It doesn't feel like everything's about to fall apart, except something just feels off. When COVID hit, I was halfway through seminary. I was pastoring a small church in Fayetteville and commuting back and forth to Candler for classes. I had gotten in a good routine. I was going to the gym multiple times a week. I had regular times where I hung out with friends and family. And suddenly all of that changed. I went from doing everything in person to doing everything online from my house, making worship services in my house, attending classes online in my house. I didn't get to see my friends anymore. All of our lives were suddenly turned upside down. And it didn't take long for me to slip into a state of unhealth. Frankly, I was a mess. I was filled with anxiety, but I mean, who wants to deal with that? I did whatever I could to numb the pain and the unrest that I felt. Now, Kylie and I got married in October of 2020, and we decided that I was going to take a year off from ministry after graduation, and we were going to travel the country. I figured once school and church were stripped away from my life that I would be healed. So Kylie got a job as a travel nurse. We bought a camper. We packed up all our stuff and our dogs, and we headed to Fort Myers, Florida for her first assignment. It was great. We were on the beach all the time. I was enjoying that frozen concoction that helped me hang on. We traveled to Key West and to the Everglades and all over South Florida. I even got to go to the World Series. I added all sorts of things to my life to distract me from how I felt. But then our next stop was Bullhead City, Arizona. And uh, well, it's not the beach. It's right smack dab in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of the desert close to nothing with nothing to do. All of the excitement from the beach, the structures I had built to hold up my unhealth and distract me came crashing down. They were stripped away. 
There was no more distractions. I was left to sit with my thoughts and my feelings, and that was not fun. I was, let's say, uh, grumpy. Sometimes just the logistics of going to do something with Kylie and the dogs became overwhelming. Simple conversations that I had had with Kylie many times before suddenly felt like battles. I, of course, prayed for things to get better, for God to take away the pain that I felt, but it didn't happen. That's not how this works. It was in facing the pain that I was able to heal. I had to go to therapy to explore the wounds that were causing me pain before things got better. I think a lot of times we're like the crowd celebrating Jesus' entry into the city. We expect God to just swoop in and take away our pain, to magically make us feel better and safer and remove all the problems in our lives. But the lesson of Palm Sunday is that Jesus isn't the Savior we want, but he's the Savior we need. Jesus doesn't ride in on a white horse and save the day. He doesn't use the tools that the world uses like violence and unquestioned power to bring about God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. No, he humbles himself. He travels around meeting people where they are. He listens to their stories. He learns what life is like through their eyes. And he responds to the needs of others with love and compassion. He even shares meals with his enemies. He rides in on a donkey and faces the pain and brokenness of the world. He goes right into the mess. He has everything stripped away. We're always asked to do more, to take on something new. And we don't want to miss out on what everyone else is doing, right? I mean, you have to be a good parent and provide your kid with every opportunity they possibly can to, to succeed. If we say no to something at work, we might mess up our career arc. Our drive for progress and making things better has stripped away the margin in our lives. There's always pressure to work harder and be better and do more. It's no wonder that so many of us feel stressed and overwhelmed all the time. The more we add to our lives, the more complicated they get. When we reach our limits, we look for solutions. And the world offers us quick fixes and quick answers. There's magic elixirs that'll make us feel better instantly. An endless number of things that we can take or do to numb the pain. And there's always someone else to blame for our problems. It's always those people who are causing all of our problems. We are in a year that's almost assured, uh, assuredly going to be filled with tension and conflict. How will you respond? Or better yet, how are you preparing for it? When we live life at our limits, we can't take more conflict. It feels destabilizing. So often we dig in our heels and we get ready for a fight, trying desperately just to hold on to the way things are. At some point, whether we like it or not, that unstable structure will come crashing down. At some point, we have to face the pain and that is not fun. Our faith isn't about escaping the pain of the world. In fact, Jesus shows us it's about going right into it. Jesus could have raised an army to defend himself, but he didn't. The gift of our faith isn't that God gives us whatever we want and fixes all of our problems. The gift of our faith is that God knows what it feels like to suffer. God knows the sting of death. God is always with us. And as we turn towards the cross during this holy week, What distractions do you need to strip away before these distractions strip away us? Jesus didn't just leave the temple. He's asking us, why do you feel like something's off? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.